This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 160, recorded on December 2nd, 2011. Hi everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today, right here in my office, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vince. You bless us with your presence. Uh, stop it. Stop it. Is that bad? I No, it's good, but I don't bless you with my presence. Just because I got my degree at Notre Dame doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good to have you, Dixon. It's been a few weeks. Uh, I'm, enjoying, I'm enjoying being back. Where were you? Uh, good, that's a good question. Actually, I was in Shanghai. Uh, for a week. Yeah, we already did that. We yeah. know that. Where else? Um, and then I was recovering <laughs> from jet lag. <laughs> okay, good enough. Anyway, welcome. Thank you. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Do you bless us uh, with your presence? Well, I'm I'm just <laughs> pleased we have uh, Dixon's blessed presence. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs> nice day today, isn't it, uh, Alan? Yeah, it's pleasant. It's got a nice crispness to it. Yeah, but, win- winter uh, is setting in for sure yeah. here. It is. Uh, here in the uh, northeast coast, where we are on daylight time right now, uh, the, it's a crisp, cool day. The temp- no, we're on standard time. It's, we're on EST? That's right. Yes. So why do I write EDT on the schedule? I don't know why. Because it's screwed up. <laughs> Crap. All right. The temperature today in centigrade Uh-oh. is 11 degrees. Right. And let's find out what the temperature is <laughs> down in Florida. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> we would ask Rich Condit. That's right. Hi, fellas. How are you doing? It's, uh, it, um, oh, I'm doing great. And it's 70 degrees right. Fahrenheit. Uh huh. I, I can't do Celsius for you. Uh, Probably 21. 22 or something. It's about 21. Yeah. yeah, something like that. I should add uh, Gainsburg to my iPhone temperature. Gainesville. That's Gain- Gainesville. 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 What did I say? <laughs> Gainsburg. You said Gainsburg. You know, I used to joke so much and say Gainsburg that now I'm stuck to it. Well, that's a food that they feed the dogs. That's a Gainsburger, actually. <laughs> All right, we have a special guest today from the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Center, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, also here on the Northeast Coast, Pat Moore. Uh, hi, Vince. Hey, hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Pat, you used to be here for a while. I used to see you often. And now we don't see you anymore, but welcome to TWIV. I, I moved to Pittsville. <laughs> Pittsville, that's right, <laughs> that's <Like> Greensburg. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's good to have you, and I hope you have a good time. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm twivering with excitement at being here. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> yeah, good So, Pat, is, uh, uh, can I call you a virologist? Uh, <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> That's a bit of a stretch, stretch but yeah, yeah, you could, I guess. You might ask him how he I'm would take that first. One. I, <laughs> would you like to be called a virologist? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure. But All you're right. in the uh, cancer center, so you're uh, you're involved with cancer, right? Right. And, right. Uh, well, let's let's find out for everybody. Actually, you, some one of our listeners requested your presence. Oh, I find that hard to believe. It was probably you, right? <laughs> it could have been me. <laughs> so uh, let's find out a little bit of your history. Where, when you were haploid, where were you? <laughs> sure. I'm sorry, Rich, that I stole that from you. Uh, no, you. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm flattered. <laughs> I think that. So, I'm Rich, flattered. at his seminar, mentioned before all you people were hap- when you you people were all haploid. I was doing these experiments. Did you get that from anyone in particular, Rich? I made that up. That's How a brilliant, about that? That's brilliant really good. Remark. Excellent. Remark. That's really good, Rich. We all love it. So, Pat, when you were haploid, where were your parents? <laughs> well, it's been so long since I was haploid. It's kind of hard to, to remember. But I grew up in Utah and Wyoming. Oh, oh. right. So uh, I went to the university. Uh, no, 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 no. Let me take that back. I went to <laughs> Westminster College. And uh, this is a plug for uh, small liberal arts colleges. It mm-hmm. was, uh, even today, it is probably has the highest per capita number of winter Olympians for any college in the United States or elsewhere uh, mm-hmm. because it's a ski college. Everybody goes there in order to ski in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, this must be in Utah then. Yes, it is. Uh, but we also we had four biology majors wow. in my class. And three of the four got over 95 percentile on their advanced placement, GREs in biology. Son of a gun. Hmm. 
I won't tell you which part of that group of or <laughs> I was in, but nonetheless, no, it, it shows that, that uh, small liberal arts education can really give you something to start with. So um, after that, I went to, uh, I tried to get into medical school, failed. <laughs> so I went to Stanford and I got a uh, master's degree in biophysical chemistry. Wow. And then went back to the University of Utah Medical School. But now they let me in. Right. And I got a degree while I was in medical school. I took a year off and did some research. Got another master's degree in uh, anatomy, really cell biology. Hmm. Uh, I became interested in international health. This this is long. You can stop me at any no, no. time. Sorry, no, this is good. <laughs> I think we've gotten to the to the the early 1980s so far. Uh, so I I w became interested in international health, and I worked in in Ghana as a bush um, doctor after medical school for for oh. a few months, and also in Liberia. That's brave. Well, <laughs> and I decided to uh, learn French, which I didn't know. Hmm. So I did an internship at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal, where I learned lots of Yiddish, but I didn't learn <laughs> the French. <laughs> and then after that, I went to the EIS program at CDC. Sure. And so that's a two-year program where they take people who really don't have any background. It's an amazing program, and it has an amazing history. And I, I don't say that lightly, um, uh, but they take people and give them two years in which they are the expert for the United the, the, the nation's health in a particular area. And That's the EIS stands for Epidemiologic Investigation Service. Intelligence or Service. Intelligence Int Service. Ooh, please, please. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. <laughs> and it was, Let's not denigrate this too far. <laughs> I've described these guys as the CDC's SWAT team. Is that There fair? you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it, actually, the, the EIS, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, was formed by um, Langmuir uh, in the 50s, I believe. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why it has that name is it sort of sounds a little bit CIA-ish. That's true. Right? Yep. And part of the reason for that was the funding for this program was based on, was sold to Congress and to, to the president that that uh, we needed to have a group of, a, a SWAT team to take care of, of uh, Cold War worries about bioterrorism. Right. And so it, at a very early stage, it was involved with, with the biodefense issues. But that was a little bit of a... No, oh, a cover hand. story. It was a cover <laughs> story. The guys who were there really wanted to do just public health. Right. And the last thing they wanted to do was be involved in, in biodefense. And so, uh, but I, I went in that program and I was uh, in working on uh, African meningococcal meningitis epidemics for two years. Uh, in Africa? A lot, a lot of travel. Yeah, in Africa and Chad and Ethiopia. Uh, this is before the the revolution, back when the Dirk were. This is what amazes me about the EIS is that it, it has a global presence. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. because other countries' health problems tend to become <laughs> ours. <at some> point. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's right. right. That's right. Got it right. And so um, after that, I met my wife in medical school, and after a very long engagement, maybe seven years or so, we decided to get married finally. And we got married, moved to San Francisco, uh, where she was doing training in neuropathology at Stanford. And I went to UCSF. So I picked up my third master's degree, a master's wow. of public health. There you go. So now I have more degrees than a candy thermometer. <laughs> and, okay. I never heard that one. Before. That's a good one. That's a good one. We we all like that one. Well, <laughs> that's got to be the I, title of this show. Yeah. You could more you degrees. Can, oh, you I get it. Ooh, more, degrees. more degrees. Yeah, yeah yes. I got more. It. But more. worse than that. Well, what one, one could say that that I have successfully performed a number of masters training um, programs, or I have a lot of failed PhDs under my belt. <laughs> so, 
Um, but after that, I went back to CDC and I started working on arboviruses. Oh, wow. And in Colorado? Refugee. Did you go to Colorado? This is in Colorado. That's exactly right. There's a, a small with Dwayne station. Dwayne Goobler? You worked with yep. Dwayne Goobler? The one and the same. I'll Dwayne. be darned. I never knew that about you, Pat. Sure. I'll be darned. Sure. We have more in common than you think. <laughs> 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 We're too busy. We haven't sat down and talked. We, we have not. Go have a cup of coffee. Or drunk or doing, done something. That's for sure. <laughs> that's right. Dixon usually goes to lunch. <laughs> that's right. He's been out to oh. lunch. No, that's not correct. That is not you, correct. You are. Out to lunch? Sure. Whatever. Sorry. We're, we're in uh, Dwayne Goobler's group. Okay. We're in Dwayne Goobler's. No, no. And so what, was your, I, what was your of that? Uh, that would be in the early 1990s. In uh, okay. 90, 80, uh 90 through 92. And I went to Somalia uh, for the Black Hawk Down thing. Um, Actually, it was before that. And um, our report was used to as part of the justification for the invasion Mm. uh, for that. But I I realized that I'm highly allergic to to lead. Yes. Yes. Especially high speed lead is particularly (laughs) allergic. (laughs) So... So I told you this was going to be long, Vince. You it's can okay. cut me off any time. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. No, you, so, you will outdo Robert Quads on TWIP if you keep going like this. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I moved to my wife, Yuan Chang, uh, took a position at Columbia University in neuropathology. And I then had to figure out how to go to New York so I became the city epidemiologist for six months. And about that time, we started being interested in finding new viruses. We found one, and so I quit and decided <laughs> to work in her lab. And then the School of Public Health at Columbia rescued me. They gave me a, a salary and put me on the faculty. And since then, I've, I've now moved to, to Pittsburgh, but... That's my life story in a, in a very wow. long... And your wife is in Pittsburgh now, too? My wife is in Pittsburgh. We work together. Everything that we've done since 1994 has been a seamless collaboration between Excellent. the two of us. Excellent. Congratulations. Excellent. Uh, so during the course of this, uh, to what extent and in what capacity have you used your MD degree? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> Rich always wanted an MD. <laughs> well, you know, no, you Rich know always wanted an MD's salary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the worst of all possible worlds: no MD's out salary, but I had to to pay to go to school for it. Ah. Um, well, I think it, it, in a serious sense, and I think your question is serious about uh, MD education. Um, it's been really, it was really, really useful um, because you're force fed so many things about the biology of humans and you can learn a lot and in medical school, obviously. Um, but you have so much that you're, you're, you learn in that period and little things pop out and you learn from them again in the laboratory and it makes sense. Uh, so I, I think it's, it was a long, t- long period to, to, to go through medical school, but it was really helpful for me scientifically. Did you use your MD degree, you know, in a clinical sense in your EIS service? N- not really, no. No, um, I really haven't treated patients for since I, I left my internship. I, yeah, I mean, I, a few minor cases, um, you know, when I was at uh, in the refugee camps and things like that, but I haven't consistently seen patients for a long, long time. Are most of the people who go into EIS MDs, and how hard is it to get in? Most of them are, but not all of them. Uh, They have vets. They have dentists. They have nurses. Um, Most of these people will have some background in public health. Um, So they'll they'll have some idea of uh, perhaps a master's degree in in public health or at least some training. Um, But they've even had a very successful, amazingly successful um, uh, uh, sanitarian, uh, work who is a sanitary engineer, uh, go through EIS and, and did a wonderful job, um, with refugee work. I would assume it's pretty competitive getting in. Is that correct? I think so. 
Um, they've expanded it in the last few years, a um, few years being 10 years. Uh, and so there are more slots, and, and it's been up and down in terms of the direction uh, that, that EIS has been going. So I've lost a little bit of touch with, with uh, current EIS officers and what their experiences are. But it, it, it usually, I'd say, about uh, something around 25% of people are, are accepted into it. Well, I had a former student, Rich, a Ph.D. student, who applied <clears throat> to the EIS out of my lab. Mm -hmm. And she didn't get in, and they told her to go get a master's in mm -hmm. public health. Right. So she did. And then when she applied again, she got in. Yep. Cool. I have a student who I'd really like to see doing this. She's completing an MPH now. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the person that I remember most about uh, being at Columbia early on uh, was Mark Greenberg, who was an infectious disease fellow here, became an EIS officer, and his first assignment was to the Mayflower Hotel in Philadelphia, the yeah. outbreak of Legionella, and he didn't have a clue as to what it was. And he just said, oh, I'll just go down there and do that, without realizing what the health risks were. <laughs> yep. There's a book on the EIS written recently, Inside the Outbreaks, by yep. Mark Pendergrast. We've been meaning to have him on TWIV for a while, but uh, I read it a while ago. We all did in preparation. Yes. And there is a, par a, a page on Patrick Moore in this book. There you go. 1987, Patrick Moore got a call from a New Jersey public health official about a case of meningococcal meningitis in someone who had just flown back from Mecca. Pretty cool. I'll, can I tell you just a, yeah, a sure. little snippet of, of that story? Oh, so please. it was a brand new, brand new um, EIS officer. I was still reading the books to learn about Nyseria, to learn about, <laughs> you know, really how to spell it. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and so I got a call from the, the New Jersey Health Department, and they said, we've got two people who've just recently been to Mecca, and they've started seizing on the airplanes coming back. And that chain of events, we also knew there was an epidemic in Mecca. And so we, we assumed that an epidemic or epidemogenic strain of Nyseria was being imported from Mecca into the United States with these flights. And so we had to get up there fast. And so I went there in the morning, got the call about 11 o'clock. By 6 o'clock, we had a team together. We stayed in a sleazy hotel somewhere somewhere out by JFK. I'm not even certain whether it still exists. And the next morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, we were on the, the tarmac or the, the concourse, stopping everybody as they were coming through and taking um, throat swaps wow. from everyone. Wow. So wow. It, it takes an enormous amount of organization skills to successfully do something like that. And I was just part of a team, but, but that, that shows you something that has to happen very quickly and, and it does somehow it's another quote from you in this book most eis recruits are not run-of-the-mill people they aren't doing it to make lots of money we really felt we were putting ourselves at risk selflessly facing down bad diseases to help other people here here cool. i said that <laughs> <laughs> that's in quotes <clears throat> <laughs> Sound like, sound good. Uh, it sounds like a really cool job. It's great. It is a good job. So you said you discovered a virus and you decided to work on it. That would be Kaposi's sarcoma virus, right? That's exactly right. And you did that before you came to Columbia? No, we did that. At, well, in a sense, yes. We did it at Columbia. I was at the Department of Health okay. at the time. Uh, Yuan was starting as a new assistant professor in neuropathology at Columbia. And we, she was looking, actually, she was very interested in trying to identify loss of heterozygosity in, in brain tumors. And I had been in Nigeria, and there was an outbreak of a hemorrhagic fever. And people were dying. There were, blood was coming out of their ears and eyes. It was Lassa? just awful. Lots of uh, well, we didn't know. All of our uh, tests were, were negative. It turned out that it was a minor strain variation of yellow fever. Oh. So if we had known, and the, the patients didn't have the classic symptoms of, 
of uh, uh, hepatitis at least wasn't obvious. So if we had known, of course, we could immediately take 17D and start vaccinating this population. And that said to me, all, one thing that, of course, I knew, but, but it really brought it out, is that until you've proven what the agent is in an outbreak, every new outbreak is, in, is an unknown disease. Here, here. Especially in Nigeria. <laughs> Especially in Nigeria. And especially when the symptoms aren't aren't necessarily obvious, uh, or at least uh, uh, meet, fee, uh, meeting the paradigm. So, so one thing that would at this time, and this is ancient history, 1992, 93, is I began to think about, well, geez, what if we had a um, sequence-based method for identifying what the agent would be? How could we do that? And um, since I, although I obviously am not a, a virologist, or at least my training is not in virology, I, I had a little bit of lab work under my belt. And so I began to explore that. And at that time, a group, uh, Wiggler's group at Cold Spring Harbor um, uh, with the Lysitsens published a technique called representational difference analysis. And I sent the paper, it's a science paper, and what, the, what this technique allows you to do is subtract the genome from two samples. So in this case, if you have diseased tissue and it's chocolate block full of uh, pathogen, then you could subtract that genome from healthy tissue from the same patient, and hopefully you'd be able to identify the genome. So that sounded pretty good. And I sent that to my wife, and she said, hmm, looks good. Well, let's try it. What should we work on? And uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a husband-wife conversation to me. Right. <laughs> Have some more roast beef. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so there was a disease called bag bacillary angiomatosis that had just been shown to be caused by an agent, uh, a bacteria, and it's an AIDS AIDS-related uh, disease. And I thought, oh God. Don't, don't have that one. So what else is there? Well, there's Capshi sarcoma. Oh, if people say there's likely to be a virus there, well, let's try it. See. So Yuan was in pathology, and and I have to say it sounds like I was doing all of the the work here, but that's not true at all. Uh, RDA is a really kind of a tough protocol, and she got the the protocols put it together with her, her fellow Melissa Pesson, who was uh, in pathology at the time. And they, uh, we went down on a, I remember it was on a Saturday afternoon, there'd been a case of AIDS, uh, a KS, and the patient, we went to the autopsy room and the patient had just florid KS, just tumors all over the skin. So we dissected out Dissect it off the top layer because you can't have it contaminated with bacteria, skin bacteria. And we dissected out the tumor, and then we did the same thing with the control tissue and gave, put it in the, 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 the cups, gave it to you, Anne, and I said, see you later. i got to go back to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is a long answer to, to Vince's question, was I at Columbia? And the answer is, while she was doing this, I was at, uh, at the health department. We'd go back and forth, and I would work after hours um, putting the yellow pipette tips into the boxes and things like that. <laughs> Come on, Pat. You must have done more than that. <laughs> Not much more. So this, from this single tumor, you identified the, the viral sequence. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the amazing thing about that is, is it turns out that that patient, at, at that time in the AIDS epidemic, um, Pathologists were not doing autopsies on AIDS patients anymore. And so this was the last AIDS patient that they sent to autopsy for about three years after that, the very last one. And also, when we, after we'd found the virus and, and looked at the DNA content and the tumors, it turned out that by chance, this had the most viral DNA in it um, of any of the tumors that we'd mm -hmm. looked at. So by chance, we just picked the right tumor and... and did the right things and, and found the virus. Never underestimate the importance of luck. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that is a herpes virus, of course, right? That's right. Which number? It is number eight. 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 It's commonly called human herpes virus eight or KSHV, Capshi sarcoma herpes virus. 
And how many of the normal people out there have antibodies to that? Mm-hmm. Very many. Um, so the issue was when we found that, just finding the virus doesn't prove that it causes the, the tumor, of course. And right. so when we found it, it raised a lot of controversy for a lot of reasons. But one of the, the reasons why it was controversial is that there was a dogma within the herpes virus community that all herpes viruses are ubiquitous. We're all infected with the, the human herpes viruses that are known. And hence, it's not likely that this virus could be unusually rare and could account for this tumor. And so, so it turns out we, we made an antibody test and, and uh, tested patient serum. We just didn't see antibody reactivity in most controls. And those groups that were at risk, which are primarily gay men that we were looking at in the United States, or patients from Africa had very high rates. And then intermediate risk groups like uh, people from Mediterranean countries had an intermediate rate of of seroprevalence. But in terms of general blood donors, probably it's on the order of uh, 1% to 2% of blood donors are positive. Is it present in every uh, KS tumor? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, you know, I mean, within within the the, the limits of technical yeah, limits sure. of detection. Yeah, but but now it's it's generally thought to be universal. So it's like uh, cervical cancer is universally associated with one of the yeah. the HPV genotypes, and KS is universally associated with KSHV. So the KS that occurred before AIDS, uh, presumably, was also caused by this virus. That's right. That's right. And one of your papers you wrote, uh, Forgotten But Not Gone, about mm. KSHV. Why is that? Right. Well, what I was concerned, what we are concerned about is that um, in terms of the science, there's just spectacular science that's been done on KSHV. So it's an interesting virus. I have to tell you, it, uh, we sequence the genome and it has these um, uh, uh, homologs to a whole bunch of interesting viral uh, human genes like cyclin, inter, uh, interferon regulatory factors. It has cytokines, has chemokines, has complement binding proteins, a lot of interesting stuff. We know uh, there have actually been studies that have accidental studies where, where, where um, uh, in a clinical trial, randomized blinded clinical trial, um, a group was trying to prevent cytomegalovirus eye infections in AIDS patients. And so they used a drug to prevent this from occurring in AIDS patients. And it was okay. It was so, so effective. But it was amazingly effective <laughs> in terms of preventing KS. Right. And so that, that was worth a single sentence in a New England Journal article. But it was clear proof that the virus is can be prevented, and with antibody assays, we can detect who's infected. And we assume that since these are lifelong infections, once you're infected, you're pa- poss- it's possible that you could uh, transmit it on either through sex or through an organ transplant. And we also know, based on all the work that's been done in herpes virology, what are the likely ways that we could prevent it with vaccines. So we have diagnostic tests. We have drugs that by accident have been found to be extremely effective. These aren't even things that we were trying to, we as a a group of scientists were trying to find. And we have the possibility of vaccines. Since then, none of that has been translated into actual clinical care. You cannot go into your, your, local hospital and get a test for KSHV antibodies, or or at least a legitimate one. Pat, if a patient is suffering from AIDS and then is given the triple therapy and they had carposis, and does this then cause it to go into remission? It it vanishes. It vanishes. Yeah, it vanishes. uh, Where does it go? (laughs) Into the nervous system, like the other herpes viruses? uh, B cells, B cells. They go into B cells, cells, I see. see. So does it vanish because the immune system has been reconstituted, or is there a direct effect of the uh, uh, HIV drugs? There's there's been some argument about that, um, and uh, some of the the HIV drugs actually are are directly effective against... uh, 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 the virus, uh, azo- uh, for azo- uh, AZT, 
AZT right. is okay. uh, targets uh, phosphorotransferase in the virus, and it's very effective in, in preventing virus from replicating. So HHV8 now yeah. is part of this, uh, I guess it's a um, an order called Redino, Redinovirus or a genus. Right. That's right. And there, there are many other animal viruses related to it now in that, right? Is the, are, were these discovered subsequent to uh, HHV8? Well, the, the first Redinoviruses were found long before okay. uh, KSHV was found. And um, then the... Uh, the uh, but subsequently, what we've found, obviously, like other virus families, is that animals have a, a number of redenoviruses in them. And the interesting thing about that is that by knowing the um, uh, uh, old world primate viruses and the new world primate viruses, and also looking at at the higher and lower older old world primates, there's a virus that's closely related to, to KSHV that's missing among humans, but it's present in all the other higher primates. So from just a simple evolutionarily, evolutionary perspective, it suggests there should be an HHV9 out there mm -hmm. and circulating and possibly causing disease. Now, um, the yeah. obviously in probably the majority of people who have this, if one to, one to two percent of the population is walking around with HHV-8, mm -hmm. um, most of those people are not going to go on to develop Kaposi sarcoma, right? That's true. So in the, I, I'm, I've always been kind of puzzled about this, this people of Mediterranean descent thing. Um, what makes one particular population uniquely susceptible to reactivation of this virus? Oh well, it uh, well first. There's a couple of things I, I just want to clarify because they actually turn out to be really important. But one, it's not truly reactivation. Okay. Uh, it's the emergence of symptoms, but the virus itself is latent, and that's a fundamental aspect of right. tumor viruses. So it's not actively replicating. Secondly, uh, the best predictor of the rate of Kaposi sarcoma is actually the prevalence of infection in different populations. And many, many uh, population-based uh, studies of blood donors and, and other populations have been looked at. What we see is in Europe and North America are the lowest rates of KSHV, HHV-8 infection. Intermediate rates are found in Mediterranean basin countries. And then there's a focus of extremely high positivity in Central East, uh, Central uh, uh, African Republic and, and Eastern, uh, Western Uganda, and then uh, if you can imagine, a, uh, just imagine a, a circle radiating out from that focus in geography, the prevalence decreases, but is still very high in the rest of Africa. So in Africa, even before the AIDS epidemic, um, I, if I remember correctly, Kapshi sarcoma was the third most common tumor reported in cancer registries. Now it is the most common in many countries, and that's all, mainly driven by the AIDS epidemic, but not entirely by the AIDS epidemic. Um, so my question, Pat, is uh, the process of the uh, cancer itself. Sure. The, the skin cells, are, are these are the dermal cells that get infected. Are these dendritic cells that get infected because it's a B-cell targeting virus? or It's actually... Uh, Endothelial cells, endothelial. Uh, lymphatic endothelial cells, okay. or at least oh, lymphatic. Uh, oh, it's believed to be, be lymphatic uh, endothelium, or at least the virus changes the phenotype of gene expression to make it look like a lymphatic endothelium. Which, which follows into my question. Once you've treated patients with triple therapy and the virus goes into hiding or just disappears, like you said, why doesn't the cancer continue? What, what pressure on the cells needs to be there from the virus in order to continue this uh, sarcoma? Well, one thing that's critical, and it's, it's sort of obvious from the epidemiology, is that humans are very, very good at keeping this virus under control. Okay. Uh, as, as I think Vince or maybe Rich mentioned, uh, even though you can have 1%, 2% of people infected, very few people will develop Kapshi sarcoma. turns out to be about um, 5 per million per year. So you can work that out. Maybe one out of 1,000 people will, will develop um, the, the tumor 
when they're infected, even though the numbers are low. So what it determines who gets the tumor? Well, immunosuppression. Right. Immunosuppression. Big, immunosuppression. So who gets the tumor? The tumors are among patients who have AIDS right. or have transplants sure. or who are extremely old, the elderly. Got it. So this is really epidemiologically, this is a lot like tuberculosis. Sure. I, but, but it's, I, I think, I'm not actually certain to be honest. <laughs> okay. But the cells, the cells in the epithelium still don't replicate if the virus isn't there. Is that the true? Is that what you're saying? The moment the it, virus disappears, no, the sarcoma yeah. disappears too. Right. So when we talk about tumor virology, um, there are two general categories of, of tumor uh, of viruses that cause cancer or are assumed to. One are direct carcinogens, and those are viruses that encode oncogenes. Right. They have to be expressed within right. that cell. So all of that is happening in cysts. The virus genome is in the tumor cell, and every cell that's cancerous within the tumor has to have the virus. Right. Now, there's actually not a lot of evidence, or it's unclear, but you might also have indirect carcinogenesis, which presumably would be due to chronic inflammation that generates uh, 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 mutations that, that could lead to a virus-independent cancer. And perhaps that's what's happening in, for instance, hepatitis C infection, although it's it's not necessarily obvious. Yeah, I'm sorry, to me at least. No, I didn't say anything. Oh, so, so the point is, is that for viral tumors, you, for... HPV, for KSHV, for Merkel cell carcinoma uh, virus, um, for uh, EBV, all of these tumors, you have to have the virus in the tumor cell expressing its oncogenes. And so if your immune system is able to get rid of that virus-infected cell, then you're able to control the proliferation of the, of the tumor, even though the virus is still hiding in a latent form in, in your B cells. Okay, and it doesn't integrate into the host DNA. No, it doesn't. Uh, for the herpes viruses are, are generally believed, I, I think that there, there are exceptions that have been found, but they're generally believed to, to be episomes, uh, okay. double-stranded plasmids or circles. Right. Yeah, so let me, uh, let me try something out on you. In, in my mind, I would kind of subdivide the uh, direct carcinogenesis by viruses into two uh, subcategories. In one case, you're talking about, in the case of like polyoma or HPV, integration of a genome, in which case once you've got a tumor, you're not doing virology anymore. Okay, The virus genome is basically inactivated in the process of of uh, integration, whereas in the case of the herpes viruses like EBV or KSHV, if I understand it correctly, uh, you're still talking about an intact, potentially replicating virus that's uh, promoting the tumor. Is that, I, is that a fair analysis? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you two have never met before? <laughs> no, just, just kidding. <laughs> It is a fair analysis, but it's, it's more complex than that in the sense that one characteristic that we see for all of the tumor viruses, there are seven known tumor viruses. And let me, let me um, say oh, something yeah, uh, that, that I think some, some background that's important. First of all, one out of five cancer cases worldwide are caused by infection. One out of five. Now, we don't think of that. So if you go to your doctor and your doctor tells you you have cancer, you don't say, well, is there a chance it could be caused by a virus? Uh, but if you think about the world, the leading causes of cancer in Southeast Asia, for instance, are nasopharyngeal carcinoma caused by EBV, hepatocellular yeah, carcinoma yeah. caused by HBV mainly, uh, hepatitis B virus mainly, uh, some hepatitis C, uh, cervical cancer caused by HPV in Africa, it's Kapschi sarcoma. Uh, uh, cervical cancer, stomach cancer caused by Helicobacter uh, pylori, uh, schistosomiasis causing um, bladder cancers. That's right. So, so all across the world, there are very different rates of ca of cancer, and it turns out on average, uh, one out of five cancers worldwide are caused by infection. And I'll be damned if if you can go to your local um, uh, uh, oncology department 
and find one out of five um, professors <laughs> working on on infectious causes of cancer. And it's just not the case. But what we've learned over over the past 40 years, really, since the 1960s, is that, yes, indeed, there are viruses that cause cancer. And, in fact, and, and I might as well, you know, pull out my stick and, and beat you guys over this. I was actually looking through your archives, and there's very few article, uh, uh, shows that have been devoted to, to tumor virology, except for the uh, XMRV fiasco. Um, we did do we did do HPV. Did you? Do, oh, I I missed that. I yes, missed we did. That. Yeah. I missed that. Well, I looked on cancer. We had I HPV and we had HPV. We've had HCV. If I would have done yeah. carcinoma. Yeah, my my or, first suggestion for the show other. title was more term, tumor viruses. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the one we'll use. Yeah. <laughs> so let me let me get back to the original point was about replication. Why that's um, uh, so all of these viruses that do cause cancers generally cause cancers in patients who are immunodeficient or at least you see a higher rate of the cancers occurring in mm-hmm. immunodeficient populations. Right. That's one thing. and We see that most clearly with um, KSHV, but also it's true for HPV. It's, it turns out to be true for the hepatitis viruses and strangely enough for um, helicobacter pylori as well. The second thing, getting to the point about rep- replication is what is common among these viruses is they tend to be non-permissive in the tumors. Mm -hmm. If they're replicating, they will initiate host defenses, innate immune responses that will kill that cell, which is the reason why oncolytic therapies, pox viruses, for instance, Rich, that are used work is because these, the the viruses that are replica- actively replicating and producing capsids provoke cellular pathways, multiple uh, cellular pathways that initiate cell death. And that's obviously incompatible with a, a tumor. So what is, cons- what is common among these viruses is that they're persistent and non-permissive or at least not actively replicating. That doesn't mean that every tumor cell is not replicating. There are a minority of tumor cells in EBV-infected tumors and KSHV-infected tumors, less than 1%, 2% of the tumor cells, that will be actively replicating. But the bulk of the tumor mass is from a non-replicating virus, expressing a viral oncogene that is driving, in part, together with cellular factors, driving the, the tumor to, to proliferate. That's the reason why I, I would say that that the that replication is a key feature of tumor genesis or lack of replication. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, or that makes perfect fair, sense. So, fair. so is the is the lymphatic endothelial cell then a non permissive cell for KSHV? I don't think so. No, in fact, people uh, also. I actually, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say, I haven't worked much on KSHV for the last um, four years, but um, people people use um, uh, uh, lymphatic endothelial cell cultures for growing the virus. Not very well. You can't grow the virus very well, but mm-hmm. the, the level of replication that you can get is best generally in endothelial cell cultures. Okay. So you mentioned Merkel cell uh, virus, and that's, right. that's a virus you discovered when you moved to Pittsburgh, is that correct? That's exactly right. So tell us the story there. So Yuan and I were keen on finding new cancer viruses. And we actually started the study back at Columbia in uh, about 1998. So we've, it, it, it seemed clear that representational difference analysis, RDA, it's a wonderful technique. Um, but it really is geared towards finding larger genome DNA um, viruses. It wouldn't work for finding hepatitis C very well, at least, unless you did some subtraction of a, of a uh, cDNA library. So <clears throat> we were wondering how could we approach this, and we thought, well, maybe we can just sequence to it. Uh, we don't really know in a tumor what are the percentage of viral Transcript, what are the percentage of transcripts in a tumor that belong to a virus? It's an unknown quantity. So we thought, darn it, that's what we'll do. Just sequence it and see if we can do it. Um, 
And there's a couple of problems with that. First, the genome had not been completed, and so that was a problem. And secondly, um, sequencing technologies, you know, just weren't, weren't uh, it was just too expensive to be able to do that. But um, you, ultimately what we found was that we could, using uh, serial analysis of gene expression, uh, uh, a technique that, that samples the, the five prime ends of, or three prime ends of, of cDNA transcripts, we were able to get a fairly good representation, about a 500,000 um, uh, transcript representation of a tumor and show whether or not there is likely to be a virus present in the tumor. So it did seem to work. Um, and so we then turned our attention to, to Merkel cell uh, because this is, again, a tumor that is, it's a very rare tumor. It's a skin tumor of the Merkel cell organ, which is responsible for uh, stretching and, and touch sensations in the skin. Uh, and it is a tumor that occurs mainly among the elderly, and it has, it's been shown to have a, I believe, a, a 12 or 14-fold higher rate among AIDS patients. Hmm. So over a five-year period, and this is to your listeners to say, yes, delayed vet gratification can be good for you. <laughs> So from 1998 to, to 2007, we were working on this project. Uh, the other um, uh, breakthrough that we had was hiring Wee Chen Fong in our laboratory, who changed all of our computer scripts. And then Pure Sequencing was done, was, was developed. Mm. And so we, were, we had seven years of preparation, five years to get the tumor samples. And then once we... Had all of that, we sent it off to have it 454 sequenced, and within three weeks we uh, got the answer back in three weeks, and 12 hours later we knew we had a new polyoma virus. Wow. So. It took that long. <laughs> it took that long. <laughs> so you, if you were doing it today, maybe you are, you, yeah, would, we you are. would use the same approach, right? Yeah. The funny thing, we were lucky again in a lot of different ways. Um, first of all, uh, uh, 454 pure sequencing was um, the gave you gave us the longest reads, mm -hmm. uh, and also, of course, the the biggest problem with our approach, which we call digital uh, transcriptome subtraction, that's essentially doing the same thing as RDA, where we physically subtracted the genome. Here we're digitally subtracting the tumor transcriptome from known databases, the RefSeq databases, and variety of other... So, things. for our listeners, let's make that clear. The RDA, you take DNA, genome DNA, and then subtract that from transcripts, from cDNAs? No, oh, you have to subtract that from the same patient's genome. Okay. Gen so Genome so versus genome. Genome versus genome. DNA versus DNA. Disease tissue versus right. healthy tissue. Okay. That's the idea. And the, and the subtraction in, in that case, in... in your original experiment was done analog, so to speak. You're, you're actually doing a chemical subtraction. That's exactly right. What it is is it's a PCR-based technique where you can imagine you make two libraries. One has primers on it and the other does not. If you were to mix those two libraries together, heat them up and re-anneal them, only half of the for, – for every gene that's in common, every place where there's a PCR priming site that's in common between the two libraries – you'll only have half of the, the DNA strands have a primer. And that won't, uh, that won't exponentially amplify. However, right, so if you have a unique piece of DNA, that will only be able to find its mate within the disease tissue genome, and that will exponentially amplify. So it has a differential amplification, and that's how it, it subtracts out the, 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 the uh, sequence. So you can subtract sequence without knowing what the sequence is. That's exactly right. Is the key. Yep. As long as it is present at some reasonable copy number within the diseased tissue. And, but now there are many caveats to this. Um, one is the, the copy number. Um, the other is the size of the genome. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, Wiggler uh, has a very nice comments about um, it's necessary to simplify 
the genomes before you actually do the subtraction. And I think that we're doing the same thing in our DTS and that we're not actually just taking in DTS, a digital transcriptome subtraction. We're not just taking all sequences that we get off of the read uh, from the machine and throwing them at databases. Instead, we sequentially um, pattern match everything that is known and subtract it. And then we're left with a much smaller candidate pool of highly well-defined high fidelity sequences where we know every base pair is, is correct as far as, we, as far as we can tell. And yet it's not found in the expression um, mm -hmm. databases. And from that, then we can open up our alignments and now it's much easier to find an entirely new alignment, which is what we did with, mm -hmm. with MCV. So, right. so in essence, it's a, a, there is a, a steps of, of simplification that occur. So what is the evidence that MCV causes the tumor? Um, so when we did this, um, we found the transcript, the first transcript we pulled out, turned out to be to T antigen, which is a major oncoprotein. Uh, of, it's actually a multiply spliced uh, oncoprotein from this virus. And it was integrated into chromosome three in the tumor. So as we sequenced it, we, uh, we, we did what is known as three prime race and five prime race to extend the sequence. And so as we did that, we extended the sequence on T antigen and all of a sudden it became human hmm. sequence. So when that happened, we knew, holy smokes, um, the virus is integrated into the, the genome of this tumor and it shouldn't do that if it's a freely replicating polyomavirus like EBV or KSHV, it should be a circular DNA episome, but in the tumor, it's integrated. So that actually is a marker for monoclonality. We can do southern blotting, and, and a friend of mine has said that uh, he was utterly amazed by our paper because it's the first time he's seen a southern blot um, uh, in Science Magazine in the last 20 years. So we, we published a Southern <laughs> blot in which we looked at a variety of tumors and we could see that their integration patterns were different within each tumor. But the important thing is it wasn't a smear. It wasn't as if there are multiple integration sites within any given tumor. So that says it's monoclonal. And what does that mean? It means the virus was present in that cell that was destined to become a tumor cell before it started replicating. And we could then show that it was that the virus as it, as it metastasized was um, the, the same integration point was present. So that's a very critical factor in causality is showing a, te a correct temporal sequence that the virus is present before the tumor occurs. And also and, that it integrated in different places in different patients. That's right. That's right. Although one could one could argue that it would be a, a feature of this virus that it might integrate into a, a spot that could cause insertional mutagenesis. Right. Uh, where it just dis de destroys a, a cellular uh, tumor suppressor gene, and and uh, therefore that makes it more likely for the tumor to occur. So that's yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm, I, I think I've been talking long enough. <laughs> uh, no, because uh, you were going to uh, finish the associate. I just want to make sure before we get too far into this, because I don't think we've discussed polyomaviruses before. And I want to make sure that the basics of polyomaviruses are revealed to the, to the listeners. <laughs> but um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can finish with your association with the cancer, because well, there's more, right? Well, but Rich, if, if you could if you could chime in on on what polyomaviruses are, uh, well, um, okay. So let let me give it a let me give it a run and uh, see how it works. Just very simply, small double stranded DNA containing viruses, uh, about five kilobases. That's enough to encode roughly five genes. Circular DNA, um, uh, encapsulated in a naked capsid. Uh, the gene structure, the genome organization is very simple. About half of the genome is devoted to what we call uh, early genes, 
which can be as simple. Well, I guess there's always at least two splice variants, right? A large right. and some smaller, what's called T antigen. It's called T antigen because uh, it was originally discovered uh, using immunological techniques as a viral protein that was specific to tumors caused by the virus, hence the word T. Exactly. So there'll be a couple of uh, early genes uh, that have normally roles in combating the innate immune response from the cell and also in virus transcription and DNA replication. And those are the uh, T antigen genes. And then a couple of late genes that are just capsid proteins. Right. Uh, and, and normally, and if these, you express them in a cell, they will self assemble, just like the HPV right. vaccine, which is important. Uh, and uh, normally, uh, there's a variety of these things in uh, all sorts of vertebrate hosts. They pretty much, uh, uh, given uh, uh, viruses of a given species, pretty much stay confined to that species, don't jump species barriers. Um, and within a given species, by and large, they're pretty benign. The human viruses, for example, are ordinarily uh, acquired as a respiratory infection and uh, wind up uh, establishing a persistent infection uh, in the kidneys. Uh, most uh, are asymptomatic and under conditions of immunosuppression can cause some other nasty diseases. Now that I've run through this, I realize we have done that run down before, but a long time ago. <laughs> Reinforcement's always good here for me. Right. <laughs> I've got to go to Florida and take your class, because that was excellent. <laughs> I will so, learn something from that. So that's so that I just want to make sure people got the basics. So so there so that's what the polyoma viruses are. And um, uh, those of your listeners who are familiar with papilloma viruses, the T antigen actually has many of the features of the early genes in papilloma viruses. It's just that in papilloma viruses, they're all discreetly separated in different genes, whereas they happen to be in one large protein, large T antigen, or they have um, functions that are in the uh, other splice variants. For instance, in, the, in this virus, MCV, there, there's a small T that's, that's made, and that binds to PP2A. Um, so the, the evidence that this virus actually causes disease is that, one, it's clonal. Uh, but secondly, the interesting thing was that when we were sequencing the viral genomes, um, Masashuda, who's another postdoc in our lab, is directly involved with this, this work, um, we were looking at the, the, the sequences and all of the T antigens were mutated. And, oh, my God. That's the very worst thing. If you want to convince your audience that your virus is causing this disease, which is, a, I think, a legitimate thing to hope for if you find a new virus. You shouldn't be running on that, but it, you should hope that it's true. Uh, the last thing you want to see is that the major oncoprotein that, that, makes, that, that, that causes tumors is mutated. But we, looking at it a little bit more closely, what we realized is it was mutated in a special way. It has a helicase domain that's responsible for opening up the viral DNA to initiate viral DNA replication. And it binds just to the viral origin, has a very specific origin binding region. All of that's in the C terminus of this large T protein. And every tumor, every virus that we looked at from different tumors has that truncated. So going back to the, the point of permissivity, the virus can't replicate in tumors. If you were to amplify it off of your skin, it would be fully intact and it would be capable of replicating. So part of the fundamental process of it being able to cause tumors is that it loses its ability to, to replicate. That's interesting. So the non-permissivity uh, doesn't have to do with the host being non-permissive. It's the virus becoming debilitated with respect to its own replication. That's right. Hmm. So, so SV40 is, of course, the, the, the most prominent member of the polyomaviruses, and almost everybody who's working in the laboratory has worked with SV40-derived um, genes or, or promoters and, and, and so forth, um, or cell lines that are even infected with SV40. Um, Yakov Glusman, back in the early 1980s, showed that... SV40 for it to transform cells 
human cells, if you had the wild type SV40 and you put it into human cells, it wouldn't transform. It wouldn't cause them to grow into to tumors. But if you put a single point mutation in the origin so that the virus no longer could replicate, then it was highly efficient in causing transformation. So here's a case where just eliminating replication was able to turn a virus in the same cell line and same virus into a, to a, a cancerous, if you will, um, uh, uh, virus. Now, another thing I'd like to clarify for the listeners is that this viral DNA integration into the genome is not a normal part of the replication of this virus, right? Exactly so. Exactly Ordinarily, so. it replicates as an, enzo uh, as an episome that is a small circular molecule. You make new DNA, you make capsids, it breaks the cell. This integration thing is the circle, the genome, the viral genome circle breaking and integrating at random into the chromosome, and it's essentially an accident, right? Absolutely. But if it does it with this mutated T antigen, and it does it in a fashion where you can now express these T antigen functions that are oncogenic in a permanent fashion, you got a problem. Very good point. And yeah. so fact, the whole the whole yeah. transformation is an accident, right? These viruses right. not part of their life cycle, correct? Exactly right. so. Yeah, and that's an important point. That <laughs> you said it perfectly. It turns out that. All of the tumor viruses that cause cancers in humans are, when they cause a tumor, it's a biological accident. It's a dead-end event. So that has very important implications to the virus. The virus is not, there's not evolutionary pressure for the virus to encode oncogenes. There is, it turns out that since these rare events occur that lead to tumors, that oncogenes that these viruses are carrying must be evolving for some other function. But they're not there in order to cause tumors because the virus is not replicating. It doesn't matter how many copies of the viral genome is amplified within a tumor. It will never be transmitted from me to you. And, you know, the, the most obvious case of that that people might want to think about is cervical cancer. Most cases of transmission of high-risk papillomaviruses, by far maybe all cases of transmission of high-risk papillomaviruses, are asymptomatic people having sexual contact. It is not due to asymptomatic men having sex with women who have symptomatic cancers. So right. once a cancer forms, that does the virus absolutely no good as a uh, as in terms of an evolution, uh, uh, evolutionary aspect to the virus. So I presume you looked in many uh, tumor samples and found integrations, right? Yeah. Is it? Do you find that in every um, Merkel tumor? No, no. Only eighty percent. Eighty percent of eighty percent of Merkel cell carcinomas are positive for the virus. And then, you know, the next steps, of course, are to make a monoclonal antibody that can detect it. Mm -hmm. And then to see whether all of the tumor cells within a tumor are positive. You know, for, uh, uh, originally for XMRV, there is some evidence that the virus is act was in prostate cancers, but it wasn't actually in the tumor cells. It was in the stromal cells surrounding it. So th that would be hard to, to put together in a paradigm that this was actually driving mm. um, carcinogenesis. But when we developed an antibody, we were able to see it in, in all of the tumor cells. So that made sense. But only 80% of the tumors are positive. The other one-fifth of the tumors appear to be due to something else. We don't right. know what that is. Right, which makes sense. That's fine, right? Tumors don't all, all have to have the same origin. Right. Yeah. Um, and what's the, there is a role for small t, Right. As well. Right. Tell us about that. Oh, that's very interesting. So, uh, of course, so SV40T antigen, um, as, uh, as Rich and I were saying before the, the program, SV40 um, was used to, the T antigen was used to find uh, uh, P53. It was a very early tool in the large, this is the large T antigen, was a very early tool used in, in examining the uh, pocket proteins 
control the cell cycle, retinoblastoma um, uh, uh, proteins. And so if you put large T from SV40 into primary cells like mouse rodent fibroblasts, they will transform and you have the traditional transformation assays that grow once in soft auger and they'll, they'll form heaps in, in, uh, uh, on plates. So they'll form foci in plates and so forth. That's large T. If you do that with the small T from SV40, we know that the small T does something very interesting. It inhibits the phosphatase PP2A, which is actually a broad uh, family of phosphatases. And part of what that does is it prevents AKT from being dephosphorylated by PP2A, and hence it activates the AKT mTOR signaling pathway. But that isn't sufficient to transform a cell on its own. If you put that in the small t in a rodent um, uh, assay, you won't get any trans cell transformation. So it, in that case, large T from SV40 is transforming, small t is not. The MCV, we of course assume the same thing would be true. And, you know, and that would be minorly interesting but we were expecting to recapitulate all the same things that were true for SV40, and we just had a human example of SV40, if you will. But that's not the case. It turns out that if you put large T from MCV into rodent cells, they don't transform. If you put small T into the cells, they do transform. And so that's just the opposite of SV40, the exact opposite. Mm. So... That's interesting. What does it do? Well, it, it binds to PP2A, um, and this is work that, that Massachusetts did. Um, it binds to PP2A in cells, and we can see that it inhibits PP2A, but we can also mutate those sites within the small t, and it continues to transform cells. So the PP2A binding activity of small t is not what's responsible for transform, transformation. Instead, it's a very interesting thing. We don't really have the complete answer for it, but we have really tantalizing data that one of the functions of mTOR AKT signaling, when mTOR, the major, uh, it's a major kinase in the cell, is activated, that will initiate protein synthesis in a couple of ways. It will increase ribosomal biogenesis and uh, through pathway known as the uh, S6 kinase signaling pathway by activating S6K phosphorylation. And it will also activate CAP-dependent translation, translation of um, that um, uh, is inhibited by a protein called 4-EBP. And it turns out that 4-EBP, if it's phosphorylated, will, will no longer inhibit translation. You'll get free translation of, of a variety of, gene, of proteins, and it turns out many of them are oncoproteins, such as CMIC, uh, Survive, and other things like that. Well, if you put in MCV small t into cells, it increases the phosphorylation of this, this key protein, 4-EBP, and it inactivates it. And so it increases the cap-dependent translation within cells that are expressing it. And we can actually show by putting in a, 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 a 4-EBP that can no longer be phosphorylated so it can't be turned off, that that's sufficient to turn off cell transformation. Mm -hmm. So it appears that acting downstream of mTOR in, a, in the same pathway that I talked about for SV40 through AKT to mTOR, the same pathway, but it's doing it at a very different level down below mTOR, it's, it's uh, activating cap-dependent translation. You probably know that 4E, EIF 4E on its own is an oncogene or transform That's exactly cells, right? right? That's right. Same idea, right? Same idea. Same idea is that if you have that initiation factor overexpressed, which 4EBP is, is inhibiting the 4E complex from forming Right. on transcripts to initiate trans translation. For, that for, uh, sorry, go ahead. We'll do it. Yeah. So for listeners who uh, listened to last week, we talked about this mTOR pathway. Right. And in particular, the identification of a, a protein red, red 1. I think it's red or red 1? Red. 
that uh, it seems to be an antiviral protein that suppresses the the translation regulated by mTOR. So for flu, when flu infects cells, it seems to red seems to be uh, regulating. It seems to be regulating the ability to of the virus to stimulate transmit translation. Right, uh, and that's a new regulator that wasn't known previously. So, so this is uh, interesting because I usually think of oncoproteins as things that uh, mess around directly with proteins involved in the cell cycle. This sounds different. Do you uh, think of the ultimately the tinkering with translation as impacting on the cell cycle machinery? How do you think about this? Uh, I think that there's there's evidence now that yeah, tinkering with the, with with uh, protein expression uh, through this cap-dependent regulatory mechanism will cause um, cancer cell transformation, and so and that may be actually the major way that mTOR signaling acts as to inhibit, um, or I'm sorry, mTOR signaling acts to activate um, cap-dependent translation. And that may be the major way that it causes cancers. Um, but going back to, to a couple of your points, and I, I think that this is important, is that if we take a step back and look at all of the tumor viruses, we have HPV, we have EBV, KSHV, the hepatitis viruses are a little peculiar, so I can't talk about them. But And then MCV, they target many of the same pathways over and over and over again. For instance, retinoblastoma signaling pathway and some aspect of mTOR signaling, either upstream of mTOR or is in the case of, of uh, uh, MCV, perhaps downstream of mTOR. And so we see that, that there are a limited number of ways that these viruses actually cause cancer. There are a limited number of pathways that are targeted and they seem to be recurring over and over again. But each of these viruses are unrelated to the, each other. This is convergent evolution, if you will, of these very, very different viruses to target the same pathway. So then we have to ask, well, if it's, they're not caused cancers, what are the reasons why these viruses are targeting these specific pathways? Right. You going to answer that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <We're waiting. laughs> well, the, so the traditional view is that uh, is because because for, particularly for cell cycle regulation, that as of these viruses have to replicate when the cell is in the S phase of the the cell cycle. These viruses replicate their DNA replicates in the S phase of the cell cycle because they use all of the cellular replication machinery. So the view that developed in the 70s and 80s and 90s was that these viruses are targeting cell cycle regulation in order to promote virus replication. And that's that very well, I, I, I don't dismiss that. That is quite clearly true. However, what we see going back to the fact that these viruses are non-permissive and in the case of latency for KSHV and EBV, they why would they be targeting a pathway that would not promote virus replication? I mean, they don't need to replicate. The virus is latent. It will be replicating in tandem with the host cell. But what we've also learned is that many of the tumor suppressor signaling pathways, and I would say perhaps not all of them, but almost all of them, have probably evolved from innate immune signaling okay. pathways as single cell metazoan organisms evolved into complex um, uh, tissue specific or tissue containing um, uh, organisms there had to be a way to prevent tumor formation from occurring cells even going back to bacteria as far as I understand it have programmed pathways to commit cell death, which is only beneficial to a single cell organism if it prevents other relatives, uh, uh, daughters, cousins, uh, uh, whatever, of, of that single cell organism from be 
um, becoming, for instance, infected. So that could be thought of as the very primitive immune system. And so cell death is one way to prevent a virus from replicating. As the cell senses, in whatever ways it does, that it is infected, it could commit itself to apoptosis, which we see as a cytopathic effect. The other thing that it would probably want to do is inhibit cell cycle because, for as I've just mentioned, viruses take advantage of cell cycle transit to set the conditions where they can now replicate. So if you were to arrest a cell in G1 before it can, the cell can enter into S phase and stop it right there, then that will make it much harder for a virus to set up the conditions so its genome can replicate. And so at least two of the major pathways that we, or major broad pathways that we know um, contribute to tumor genesis are also ways that viruses use to replicate themselves. And so that the very well could be that the reason why these seven viruses of the thousands of viruses that infect humans just happens that these seven viruses do a very bad job of it and they happen to also accidentally cause cancers. But as you say, there are probably more related viruses to be found in tumors, right? Well, there's certainly... Um, do, do any of you teach microbiology? I don't know if we don't have our, our video on. So <laughs> if you raise your hand, I can't see it. But, <laughs> but you know, if you teach microbiology, um, you've probably learned about the polyomaviruses. And you probably learned that humans are infected with two polyomaviruses, BK and JC. And that was true up until 19, uh, 2007. So those viruses were found in 1971, and they were they were it for the human polyomaviruses, and they were looked at in terms of whether they caused cancer or not. Shortly uh, in in 2001, two new polyomaviruses were found: one um, called KIV for the Karolinska Institute, and the other called uh, Wu for Washington University. And then we found MCV. And since then, four additional viruses. So now the list of human polyomaviruses and, and all of these, these um, uh, uh, seven other polyomaviruses were found using genomic technologies exist on our, our, as, as part of our skin flora. Mm -hmm. We're carrying them around. We're transmitting them. We had no clue until 2007 that they existed. All of them have T antigens. So at least potentially they have the capacity mm. to cause transformation. No one has actually looked at tumors to see whether most of these viruses are present in these tumors. So, yeah, there's lots of opportunities for, for discovering a viral cause for cancer for, or for a series of cancers that haven't been, uh, haven't been uh, looked at yet. Are you doing that? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm talking to you now. I just sit around my office and do podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's Just what we kidding. do. <laughs> yeah, I know you're kidding. You know, this is an e is this EIS humor? Is that uh... yeah? It's yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which shows you <laughs> kind of shows you the level of EIS <laughs> until there's an outbreak. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, I mean, there aren't new tumors, right? But there are many known tumors, and you and as you said, they haven't been looked at for viruses. They haven't been looked at, yeah. and and so we're actually we're taking another tack. And I mean, one thing that one could do is. Now that those genomes are known, you could just make PCR primers or, or make a T antigen uh, antibody assay and look at tumors and see whether it's present. We're taking the tact um, on the opposite direction coming from uh, uh, the epidemiology side that we're, what are the tumors that look like they might actually be elevated in immunosuppression and then trying to find a virus that right. is cause, might be causing yeah. it. I have one last question. <laughs> one of shoot SV40 is not a human virus. Does it cause cancer in humans? I don't think so. No. Okay. I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's hard. That that's a uh, you know the uh, Harold Zurhausen, um, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in in two thousand and eight for his discovery of of the human papillomavirus, high risk human papillomaviruses. Um, 
he was the editor of the International Journal of Cancer, and he wrote an editorial a few years back that said, you know, SV40, I, I can't remember, let me paraphrase the title, is SV40, will we ever be able to, to figure this out? And part of the problem is, is that uh, SV40 is ubiquitous, not in people, but it's ubiquitous in laboratories. And we do not use PCR, for example, um, anymore, really, um, uh, unless we can absolutely avoid it in order to determine um, whether a virus is present because it's so easy to contaminate things. Hmm. And so for that reason, I think that a lot of the, and also let me uh, mention that SV40 is very genetically very similar to uh, JC and, and BK viruses. The two viruses that I, I said had been, pre had, had been known since 1971 as, as human polyomaviruses. So they're so similar that they cross react and neuro, neuropathologists use an antibody to SV40 in order to detect JC infection in the brain. Mm -hmm. they're, so, they're so highly cross-reactive. And those two viruses are ubiquitous. Virtually everybody's infected. And that's the, the real one point that I'd like to leave with you um, is that these are part of our flora and the mutations that occur in these viruses are actually mutations to our flora, not the somatic cell necessarily, that is undergoing cancer. And so it's mutations to our flora that can cause um, uh, cancer, at least in the case of MCV. But what we see is that um, there's been so many, so many um, identifications of SV40 that are likely to be sort of the same issues that we saw with XMRV in that it can be easily a PCR contaminant. It has cross-reactivity. But if it's, if it's very, very carefully looked for, it generally is not found in humans. That, so I, I don't think it's there. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Pat. That was great. That was great. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. You. Thanks, guys. Well, it was great being here. You want to uh, stick around for the rest of the show or do you want to get going? Love to. Love to. Love to? Excellent. All right. Let's do a couple of emails. Before we do that, I have two public service announcements. One is... Take the listener survey at triplemojo.com. If you haven't done that, do it. Triplemojo.com slash twiv. We've got, we need, we need 400 more. 400 more. Yes, got right. It. All right. The other is that uh, at the next ASM general meeting, uh, ASM is trying to experiment. They're going to try and crowdsource one of the um, topics, uh, like a talk. And so they've set up a uh, collaborative filtering experiment. There's a website. Uh, for doing this. So you can go and suggest a topic for a talk and then people will vote on it and the top five uh, will get to f travel to the meeting and, and that topic will be presented at the session. Now, now is this wide open to everybody? <laughs> uh, I don't know actually if it, if you have to be a member. Let's let's take a look at the website. Because asking the internet for topics is is really kind of It is absolutely hazardous. totally open. <laughs> and, and in fact, this was done. I was at the meeting. I was at the meeting when this, uh, when this was proposed. Uh, this is done at other kinds of meetings, uh, crowdsourcing the meetings, and it actually works out well. I have a feeling not much of the world will do this. It'll be mostly. Uh, I hope not. But you know, if something is silly, it just gets voted down. That's the idea. Well, you hope so. We hope so. Anyway, that's an experiment. ASM asked me to to tell our listeners about that. So check that out. We'll put a link to that. Uh, in the show notes. All right, we have a couple of uh, emails. I think we will do these two, which relate to last week's show. Good the idea. First is from Godfrey, who writes, Dear gentlemen, your discussion on the experiments from the Fouchier lab, creating the most dangerous virus in the world, reminded me what a joy it is to listen to a good, thorough conversation. While typing this, Dr. Fouchier walks around some floors above me. I'm in the same institute, but a different lab. I was thinking that it would be really nice if he could join TWIV for one episode and hear his arguments for his approach. Maybe after publication of his story, if at all. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. it's not published. I <laughs> Let's see where the differences of opinions occur and try to understand each other's point of view. Who would decline such an invitation from Dr. Rack and Yellow, the man who possesses a refined art that to hurt cruelly whoever does him evil? What? Uh, if you search, that's got to be some yellow, Shakespeare, right? No, it's actually the family motto. Oh. If, you, if you go to Wikipedia and search "rack and yellow," 
Uh, it oh, right, right, gives right, you that. right, right, right. No kidding. Yeah, so he That's listened. That's an amazingly informed reader. Well, we, uh, we talked about that on Twip, right? Yes, it's under your coat of arms. Another listener actually picked it up, yeah. It's under the coat of arms. <laughs> Many thanks for all you've offered in the past and for all that will come. P.S. I did the listener's survey. Thank you. P.P.S. Just discovered that Dr. Condit does not have a beard according to the drawing on the website. For some <laughs> reason, I always pictured him with a Hemingway-esque beard. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, for 33 years, he was right. <laughs> but I lost the beard about four years ago. Oh, well. And, and one member of the Twiv crew does have a very Hemingway-esque beard. Hmm. Absolutely. Hmm. Yes. wonder That's, who that uh, would be. Dr. De Pommier. <laughs> yeah. Dr. D. Dr. D. Well, you I, ought to be in competition. I think uh, <laughs> if the paper comes out, we could try getting Fouché on the show, right? Sure. sure. Why not? Uh, the next one is from Volker. I am a German science journalist who did listen to your nice blog on the Fouché story. I have to say that I liked your discussion a lot, although I do not agree on every angle of it. I did report on the story. Unfortunately, it's in German. We'll put a link to that. Easy to translate that, though. I was worried why this was published in science without publishing or discussing the data, and I could not find many experts willing to discuss the marginal information we have. But I think the public must know about this, because in my view, this virus is different from other viruses. If it's true, that it is probably as deadly and as highly transmissible. Do you know another one on this list? Although I did appreciate your discussion and the criticism of comments by Enserink and Fouché, I am wondering whether you send your critical comments to both of them to learn why they did say what they said or wrote. Just looking at the press sensationalizing this story misses the point, namely that the researchers and science reported it first. So the scientific community should deal with it the way it communicates and not just blame the press to do it if communication channels fail. That's one point. I'm also puzzled why you argue that this research should be published if and only if containment for the scientific community is guaranteed. Are you saying that even if the mutation is in the public domain, nobody could make such a virus and use it as a weapon? Or are you saying that you don't believe that this virus will be dangerous in real life? Or are you saying that the model they use, ferrets, is not predictive of what will happen in humans? So actually, I don't quite understand what your main argument is on why publishing this recipe to build a deadly and transmissible bird flu virus is of no concern other than biosafety. I'm not a fan of the bioweapon community, but in this case, I would like to see scientific discussion about what the model is and what it is not. In trying to get in contact with many scientists, I could find only one who had seen the data in Malta. He was in favor of publishing the work because of preventative measures against H5N1, but he was against publishing the five mutations due to dual use. So he was concerned, and he was an eminent flu virologist. I presume he still is. So I'm really interested why you came to a totally different conclusion without having seen the data. Hope you can send me some clues. I want to make sure that you understand that for a science journalist, this is not about creating panic, but reporting a real concern and discussing the deep questions whether or not some experiment should be done in the public domain or not. This experiment was not stupid, but the knowledge gained may be used by scientists with not so good intentions. So I would argue there is room and need for honest debate where society has a say too. It's not just internal to the scientific endeavor. Therefore, journalism kicked in. The big question is, why did science publish this report without reporting about the science behind it? What is the real agenda here? What are the motives of Fouché and Osterhaus and Kawaoka? Thanks for listening to my thoughts. I am a member of the German Association of Science Journalists, and we are taking quality issues seriously. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Very thoughtful letter. No, yep, good letter. Mm. I, I, I think I made some comments kind of... Um, pointing out that doing a story on this is problematic and Enserink is not necessarily wholly to blame. Um, he may have <clears throat> made calls to people and just not gotten calls back from the people who, uh, who would have downplayed this, and the only people he heard back from were the people who were hyping it. Mm. Um, so that's, that's where a story like that could have come from. As for why science is covering it, uh, the news section of science covers whatever's news in science, uh, so, yeah, this is an unpublished study, but it's obviously something that people were talking about. So I I don't think the existence of a story about it was problematic. I, but I, I think I said on the episode what my problems were with trying to keep this secret now that the experiment's already been done. Rich? <clears throat> um, well, there's a uh, a couple of issues here. One is... I, 
the the quote of the comment from Fouché that uh, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but the notion that he's made uh, the most dangerous virus ever created or something like that, uh, to me is not, it's, that's not proven to be true, okay? And to say something like that, if that's an accurate quote, to say something like that in a, in a venue that could wind up being uh, out in the public domain, like through the uh, science article, is in my mind just not responsible because that's a very alarmist sort of thing. So uh, I, I have issues with that. With respect to what the truth is, I think we, in our discussion, covered uh, uh, pretty thoroughly the notion that uh, from what little we understand, and as Alan already pointed out, even though we haven't seen the data, we discussed it because it was already out there, okay? People, actually, matter of fact, the original uh, discussion came up because uh, 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 somebody sent us this and said, how about this? So, so we discussed it. Uh, but the problem is that... Um, you know, uh, the ferret as an animal model does uh, is not necessarily a good predictor of what's going to happen in humans. So we really don't know uh, what this uh, what this virus, how it would uh, behave in humans. And so to extrapolate from the data and say that it's a very uh, danger, a potentially very dangerous human pathogen is just not right. It's not. But correct. it could be. A dangerous could, human pathogen, or could it be. could be nothing, or it could be somewhere in between. It, all things are true about the null set. We we have right. no Absolutely. idea because know. the data haven't been published, and right. and it's not in humans anyway. Fair enough, but we're just saying that for him to say it's the most dangerous virus is just wrong. Completely unsupported statement. And yes. now the press, as you have seen in the past week, is is running with that. Yeah. And no one is is modifying. And all the things we said, I don't want to repeat everything because we really addressed a lot of this last time. Yeah. No one is saying that passaging in another animal could attenuate virulence. Right. Uh, no one is saying that the 1918, which is probably the most deadly influenza virus known to infect humans, sequence is already out there. Right. Yep. So I, I'm favoring publishing everything because that gives everyone a chance to work on it. Yeah, right. and... And I think the position that we came down on, or certainly my position, is if this experiment was um, performed in an appropriate regulatory environment, and you know, as Rich pointed out and as Vincent pointed out, there uh, there are review committee committees at universities and at granting agencies that look at this sort of thing. And if you're going to do something genuinely stupid with a nasty agent, they'll say, "No, you can't do that experiment." Um, that's the point at which this should be regulated. Right. But this, I think, was a valid experiment to do. Find out if this, if H5N1 can, um, on its own, swap to another host. Um, and this was a reasonable way to do it. And I think as long as the containment controls were appropriate, it was an appropriate experiment to do. Once you've passed that point, if it's an appropriate experiment to do, then it is an appropriate experiment to publish. Because it's it's not been done under truly top secret conditions. Hundreds probably of people have access to these mutations and these sequences um, one way or another. So it's not secure. And why not go ahead and make it public domain, um, get this information out there so that people can look at it and analyze it. And that's how you stay ahead of this sort of thing. Hey, Pat, do you have any uh, thoughts on this this issue of publishing uh, data like these? Uh, where do you yeah. fall on this? Well, I, I, I do have to say, I've, I have an informed physicist friend uh, who sent me an email entitled, Holy shit, is this true? And <laughs> that, that deals with this question. And um, the problem is, is I'm as ignorant as, as the next person because none of the data is um, published. Um, but... I do think that it has been, as far as I can tell, wildly overhyped and would be, if, if any, even a, a small percentage of the number of people affected if this virus were to get out into the wild um, and it were to die, then it would be very unusual in terms of epidemics that I'm familiar with. And also, the other point is is that um, if I understand it correctly, and again, I haven't seen the paper, so I don't, I'm really sort of 
talking second, third, or fourth hand, and you're doing a much better job because you've actually focused on it, and you, you've kind of also you've got more brains than I do on. But um, is that it seems to me that with the mutation rates that you would see in influenza in a natural uh, human H1N1, H5N1 infection, that it's highly likely that you would get this the, these level of point mutation substitutions in a virus. I mean, it probably has the the mutation space has already been sampled. Yeah, yeah. Under natural really good infection. point. The experiment is being done all the time. Yeah, yeah if we're talking about five point mutations, then right, I, I would expect that occur to have occurred in the first human uh, incident of of bird flu. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope the paper is published so that we can discuss it again and have a little more information about Vince, what you're not exactly asking me what I think. Dixon, what do you think? I'm sorry. <laughs> Since I wasn't here last week, I have the best position in all of you. What do you to, think, Dixon? I think if somebody says it's the most dangerous virus in the world, they better define dangerous for who. And if they think it's going to kill all the ferrets, that's one thing. But the only way to find out if it's going to kill people is to release it on the public. And I think that's... The worst unethical behavior I could possibly imagine. Dr. No wouldn't even do that. So, <clears throat> you know, if this is a legitimate scientific experiment and the man has actually done the work and claimed that it is the most dangerous virus in the world, you'd have to qualify that as the dangerous for who? No, oh, ferrets. He doesn't know anything about people. Forget about it then. <laughs> ferrets are not people, as last I know. Although, ferrets are not people. Although some people have ferrets. Some people. Yeah. Qualities, <laughs> but um, it's a model. So, and every paper you read say ferrets are an excellent model for flu so uh, uh part of uh, part of volker's uh message here too is uh talking about if i understand it correctly talking about who's really causing the problem here that is if a if a science journalist reports that a scientist um you know said something outrageous yeah, then yeah. don't don't trash the journalist he's just reporting it and the scientists need to regulate themselves with respect to this sort of activity and i completely agree with that yes yeah. journalists and, and journalists can fan calls. the flames and they <laughs> yeah. shouldn't do that okay but uh you know let's let's re let's let's regulate ourselves he's got some good points there yeah absolutely, yeah, absolutely. in fact sure um we really, we really should either read the paper or talk to Fouchier ourselves. <laughs> of course, we're not journalists; we're just scientists doing a podcast. But and I, we can't read the paper. Yeah, we can't read it. And so, do you think we shouldn't have talked about it? I don't think so. I think no, we I don't to, think so. To voice our opinions. Well, and in fact, I think at the beginning of the episode, we said we we kind of groused and complained quite a bit about the fact that here we are on TWIV, we're always talking about peer reviewed research and the importance of it, and now we've got to talk about the study that we can't look at. Yeah. Right. That's a problem. Now, since last week, Peter Palazzi responded, and he said, in fact, he thought this was overblown and that he was talking to a lot of journalists, but when they published their story, they didn't reflect his um, his opinion. So I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, he's. I told the, this fellow in Germany to get in touch with Peter Palazzi. In fact, he yeah. speaks German so they can converse in the same language. Yeah, and if that's the case, then those were journalists who, who definitely screwed up. Yeah, but we won't know ever. Right. You know, it's he said, she said, so. Uh, so, but this is warming up. I mean, it's still, the if you just search for H5N1, you will get all these stories. And if you just look at the first sentence, it's doomsday. Yeah. The worst virus ever has been created. No, no qualifications whatsoever, <laughs> so it's difficult. Yeah, if it bleeds, it leads. Yep. All right, let's do a couple of picks of the week. we got to do this in 10 minutes. Okay. But we can do it. Dixon, do you have a pick of the week? I do, and I send it to you. You want me to read it for you? Would you please? <laughs> Since I can't read from all the way across the room. It's in a journal that probably Pat is very fond of, Emerging Infectious Diseases, mm. publication yep. of the CDC. Yep. And the paper is called Foodborne Illness Acquired in the United States, Major Pathogens. Right. Now, why do you like this, Dixon? Oh, well, because the first one they picked was a virus. <laughs> and we're on TWIV, twiv absolutely. So you've got rotavirus as the number one. Noro. Uh, yeah. Norovirus. I'm sorry, roto. Norovirus. 58% were caused by noro. Noro, that's right. Followed by non-typhoidal salmonella. Right. Clostridium campi. Right. Yeah, there you go. And toxo is in there, 8%. See that? It covered the waterfront. <laughs> All right. And that is an open access journal. By the way, I also read somewhere recently in another <laughs> journal article, which has nothing to do with this pick, but it's related, that the United States has to destroy between 6 and $34 billion worth of food 
mm-hmm. every year as a result of contamination with these organisms. Yeah. That's an enormous loss of food. So there are 31 major pathogens. This is the U.S. Right. That caused 9.4 million episodes of illness. It's quite amazing. I don't so know. much for the two-second rule. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> there, I read somewhere else that there's no such thing as that rule, <laughs> well, especially yeah. if you're a microbe. Okay, that's a nice article. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Uh, Rich, what do you have? So I can hardly believe we haven't done this before, but according to my research, we have not. And that is the movie Gattaca. Oh, Classic. Mm. Yes, um, it's a good one. You know, when I, uh, so this is a, a movie made in 1997. Uh, it's a science fiction movie about a time uh, uh, in 1997. It's a time in the future uh, when everybody's genome is sequenced. And it's basically about the social implications of uh, a That's world right. in which <laughs> we right. know everybody's genome sequence and can predict a lot of things about uh, where they're going and actually can uh, potentially select for who we want and who we don't, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it keeps coming up in my mind more and more frequently as <laughs> I have discussions with people and read papers and realize that this is not far off. Yeah. Okay. As a matter of fact, you know, at home on my bedside table, <laughs> I got my uh, little kit from Personal Genomes. Oh yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna fill up a bunch of tubes with spit and send them back to them. They're gonna sequence my genome. Great, you got accepted. I did. See, I I didn't get into the program. They don't want my DNA. And a couple of weeks later, your health insurance will be revoked. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So at any rate, it's an interesting movie and an interesting concept, and uh, just I just don't think it's far before. Uh, hopefully, I don't know how long I'm going to last, but hopefully before I'm six feet under, I think, you know, uh, certainly there's the potential to have everybody's genome sequence. There's well, going to be a lot know, of genome sequences out there. We have, we're going to have sequence, but we're going to have no clue what it means for a long sure. time. Right? The, the right, weirdest right. part of that movie was that these people were all striving to go to Titan. <laughs> yes. Now, Titan, as we now know, we didn't know it then, but we do now know, it's just a methane ball of lake of, it's an awful place. Why would they want to go there? So that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But there, there was a great movie, though. There was a lot of suspense. Gattaca is, of course, a sequence, right? That's right. Yep. Cool. I haven't seen it, but I should. All right. Uh, Alan, what do you have? Uh, I have a novel I just uh, finished reading recently. It's called Cutting for Stone by Abraham Verghese. Um, and I I really don't read much fiction. I haven't read, I, I don't remember how many years it's been since I'd read a novel. But um, my wife was, was pushing this on me. She said, this is amazing. This is this is as good as anything. It's as good as Dostoevsky or, or anything. This is a Whoa. really amazing novel. And, and she was right, um, as often happens. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Much to your is, chagrin. <laughs> yes, right. um, uh, in this case, I was quite pleased. Uh, Vergesi is a uh, physician and a writer, obviously. Um, he's written a couple of, a uh, couple of other bestsellers, um, that I haven't read, but I may go back to now that are nonfiction. Um, anyway, this one, this is set in uh, mostly in Ethiopia um, and then in a little bit in New York. Uh, it's the story of a, of a pair of twins uh, who both become doctors in one way or another and uh, and go about their lives. But it just the the way the story is told and the the medical aspects of it, um, it it's really it's just a whole world that you can inhabit while you're while you're reading this book and i found it absolutely compelling sounds great i'm gonna have to do this i could use a good good novel and there's and there's some virology in it too cool yeah the apparently there's a lot of uh, medicine and it's really well done tremendous amount of medicine matter of fact i'm looking at it here on amazon i'm gonna stick it on my wish list you go there you go (laughs) perfect maybe you get it'll get given to you Pat, do you want to pick anything? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. First of all, I, I hate. To, I've got a confession to make. I have never made it this far along through a Twiv broadcast. <laughs> I actually, know what the rules. Are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm one of those. I'm one of those. I'm. The, I, I'm one of those people who has a very short attention span. So about forty-five minutes is the most I can do. Particularly you when jogging. Do it in chunks. You got to do it in chunks. That's the magic of the podcast. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, I would think that that I there's a book that I'm reading now. I'm so I can't say whether it's really good or not, but I think it's really intriguing, and it's called "The Theory That Would Not Die: How Bayes' Rule Cracked the Enigma Code, Hunted Down Russian Submarines, oh. and Emerged Triumphant from Two Year Two Centuries of Controversy." Cool. And so the reason why I think that's interesting is because I've been struggling as as we've talked about today with causality. How do we know that a virus causes disease? And Cox postulates are, are long gone and Hill's criteria are really problematic. So what do we replace it with? And now there's a field of Bayesian inference that I'll let you read about. And if you like it, then there you have it. Okay, great. Thank you, Pat. All right. Uh, my pick is called the Boxwave Capacitative Stylus. This is a little <laughs> stylus you use to write on your iPad or iPhone or any capacitive device. The reason I'm mentioning this is because while I was in Michigan, I saw a postdoc taking notes on his iPad at Rich's talk, and I said, I want to do that. And I got a couple of styluses, and this turned out to be the best one. It has a very, a very firm tip, so you can get good um, writing and drawing. So it's ten bucks. It's cheap, and this is the way I'm going to take notes from now on. Wow. Okay. So that's really wow. cool. Cool. We also have two listener picks. One from Ricardo in Portugal. Uh, he sends us an article in Science Based Medicine called "Where's the Outrage?" It's about anti-vaccine stuff. So and if you're listening to this episode and you do nothing else, <laughs> read this article. Yes. Oh, this is a so great post. Good. Yes. Yeah. This is by John Snyder at Science Based Medicine, which is an excellent site. Really yeah. good. So read that. And we have a second post from Neva who writes, Hi, fellas. I wonder where she got that from. <laughs> <laughs> great programs as always. I look forward to each one, Twiv, Twim, and Twip, and lots of Twit, too. Here's a list of top science apps forwarded by William Gunn on Google+. Mendeley and PLOS staff both voted on which apps could have the greatest impact on science. Very techy and above my pay grade, though you thought you fellows would find this interesting. Thanks for your fabulous podcast. So these are apps for your uh, iPad or other iOS-type devices uh, that can be useful uh, in science. So cool. check that out. Thank you for that, Neva. And that will do it for TWIV. You can find us on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace at microbeworld.org or at twiv.tv. And we love, of course, to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. And don't forget facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology. Patrick Moore is at the University of Pittsburgh. Thanks a lot, Pat, for coming on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, it was really good, and I hope you make it this far when you listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Although you may not want to. <laughs> That's right. Well, and you've already heard this episode. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> and you know, right. when you hear it again, you hear new stuff. This is all true. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Great to have you. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank hey, you, gas Rich. as usual. Hey, You're Rich, you, you'd, you'd be interested to know that they, uh, a fisherman in South Jersey hooked and landed an alligator last week. In South Jersey? That's right. Holy cow. In one of the lakes. No alligator. It was mm. about uh, three foot long. <laughs> cool. Manatees in the Hudson. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and Dixon de Palmier. Thank you, Dixon. Hey, my pleasure. You are at verticalfarm.com, medicalecology.org, and trichinella.org. Good to have you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.